What's up everybody? In this extremely high yield video, I'm going to be teaching you everything that you need to know about the various drugs of abuse. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. This video will touch on everything that you see on this slide, so we will go through these substances one at a time in the following order. Alcohol, opioids, benzos, cocaine, methamphetamine, PCP, MDMA, marijuana, and then LSD. In each of these substances, we're going to be talking about what it looks like when somebody is intoxicated, what it looks like when somebody is experiencing withdrawal, and then we'll create some concept maps to help you associate these substances with other non-related comorbid medical conditions or complications that tend to occur as a result of utilization of one of these substances. I think that this third point is the highest yield thing that you need to take out of this video because oftentimes on USMLE or Comlex, you're going to be given a question that starts with a substance like one of these drugs, but the question will end with them challenging your ability to associate one of these substances with some complication or some seemingly unrelated pathophysiology that will be a third order question. Now officially, before I get into this video, please consider clicking the join button on my channel. You can find that join button underneath any video as well as on my channel homepage. And then lastly, probably the easiest place to find it is it's the first link in the description of any video on my channel. When you click the join button or click that link, you will sign up to be a Dirty Medicine member, which means that in exchange for financial support of my channel for $4.99 a month, you will get some cool perks. Those perks include the very sexy Dirty Medicine logo appearing after your name anytime you comment publicly on my channel, and you'll also get access to members-only voting where you can type in what you want the topic of the next video to be. So if you support free medical education, please consider clicking the join button. I really appreciate your consideration. Now let's get into this video. We're going to start with alcohol. And first let's talk briefly about what it looks like when somebody's intoxicated from alcohol and when somebody's withdrawing from alcohol. Intoxication, as most of you probably know already, includes slurred speech, ataxia, emotional lability, and disinhibition. So I think that most of us have experienced somebody that had a little bit too much to drink and they showed these symptoms of alcohol intoxication. Now, instead of just listing out alcohol withdrawal on this slide, I want to talk about it on its own slide because it's very high yield discussion to know at what timeline certain symptoms are occurring. And before we get into that, I want to take this moment to pause and point something out. In any of these drugs of abuse, whatever symptoms you see in the intoxication state, you generally see the opposite of that in the withdrawal state and vice versa. So if in intoxication you have slurred speech, ataxia, disinhibition, emotional liability, you basically have a lot of sedation, then you're going to see the opposite of that in withdrawal. So just keep that in mind when you're taking USMLE or Comlex, if you're not exactly sure what the withdrawal symptom of a certain drug is, but you know what the intoxication symptom is, generally speaking, they're going to be the opposite. So if the drug is stimulating when it's you're intoxicated, then in withdrawal, it's going to be sedating. And if the drug is a sedative when you're intoxicated, then the withdrawal state will be excitation. So just keep that in mind broadly. But specific to alcohol, it's very high yield to know the timeline for withdrawal. So instead of just putting it on this slide in one or two sentences, I want to talk about the timeline because this comes up all the time. So the first symptoms that you see between 0 and 36 hours of alcohol withdrawal are actually the mildest symptoms. So you see GI upset, tremors, agitation, and insomnia. Then what you see between 12 and 48 hours is what's known as alcoholic hallucinosis. Alcoholic hallucinosis is a very distinct syndrome of two things. One, visual hallucinations, but two, that occurs in the setting of intact orientation. So even though the person is withdrawing from alcohol, and even though the person is having visual hallucinations, they still know their name, they know the year, they know where they are, and generally speaking, they know what's going on. 
So alcoholic hallucinosis, it's a very high yield to understand this, is distinct from something we'll talk about in just a moment, delirium tremens, because in alcoholic hallucinosis, orientation is intact. Please keep that in mind. So alcoholic hallucinosis occurs between 12 and 48 hours. Withdrawal seizures, which are very severe, occur between 6 and 48 hours. And then lastly, the most severe of all of these symptoms or syndromes, delirium tremens, commonly referred to as DTs, occurs at 48 hours and beyond. So in DTs, you have delirium, which the name implies, so the orientation is no longer intact. The person does not know their name, does not know where they are, does not know the situation, etc. And in the setting of delirium tremens, in addition to that delirium or that confusion or that loss of orientation, you get a whole host of other life-threatening symptoms, such as cardiovascular compromise. Because at this point in the alcohol withdrawal, not only are they delirious, but they are in such sympathetic overdrive that it can really compromise their cardiovascular system. So let's just kind of conceptualize this to really hammer this home into your brain. So say that you've got somebody who normally consumes a lot of alcohol. Under the normal consumption of alcohol, alcohol will increase levels of GABA, and GABA is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. So alcohol equals increased inhibition. And likewise, alcohol will de decrease glutamate. Now glutamate is a major excitatory neurotransmitter which means that when you consume alcohol, you are increasing inhibition and decreasing excitation. Now, anytime you change neurotransmitters, especially at the site of receptors, you have either up or down regulation of those receptors. So with glutamate, for example, over time, as you decrease glutamate and decrease excitation, therefore resulting in net inhibition, those glutamate receptors will upregulate because the brain is thinking, I need to counteract this in some way. And this is really what leads to an excitation problem. So over time, you've got somebody who's used to constantly drinking alcohol and constantly putting their brain into this state of inhibition. They do that by increasing the inhibitory neurotransmitter in GABA and decreasing the excitatory neurotransmitter in glutamate. But over time, if you suddenly cut off their ability to access alcohol, what happens? Because of receptor upregulation, especially with glutamate, now you've got a massive increase in glutamate and a massive decrease in GABA. When you decrease GABA, you're decreasing inhibition, which results in excitation. And when you increase glutamate, especially in the setting of long-term receptor upregulation, you get massive excitation. So you've got a lot of receptors sitting there waiting to be excited. So when you remove alcohol, you get net excitation. And when that happens, the person goes into sympathetic overdrive. So it should make sense to you when you think about the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal that you see agitation, hypertension, tremor, GI upset, and tachycardia. And the reason that delirium tremens is so life-threatening is because when there's massive sympathetic overdrive confounded with the person being delirious and they're therefore disoriented, you can get cardiovascular compromise resulting in death. So that's alcohol withdrawal, and it's very important to understand not only the timeline, but also the pathophysiology in terms of how this manifests. Now let's talk about the associations. I told you at the start of this video that I actually think that the highest yield piece of information to take out of this video are the associations. Because on tests, you'll be given a question which will at first glance seem like they're gonna ask you some question about a drug of abuse, and then you're gonna see them pivot and ask you some third order question about some complication that the drug might be associated with. So when it comes to alcohol, the different disease processes that you want to keep in mind are everything that you see on this slide. Cirrhosis, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, pancreatitis, beriberi, dilated cardiomyopathy, peripheral neuropathy, which is technically part of beriberi, testicular atrophy, cerebellar degeneration, gastritis, and Marchia fava bignami disease. And I'm definitely butchering the pronunciation there. 
Now, just briefly, just to really establish some awesome neural networks in your brain, I wanna create a concept map for you and just run through each of these one at a time, pointing out the high yield things that you might look for on an exam if they started with a question on alcohol, but then pivoted and wanted you to think about some other comorbid disease or complication. So we're just gonna briefly fill in these boxes with some of these diseases. So recall that if they want you to think cirrhosis, you might see portal hypertension, bleeding, jaundice, asterixis, spider angiomata, palmar erythema. The labs, you'll see LFTs, you could see GGT. They might show you decreased platelets or changes in clotting factors. And obviously, as you can tell by looking at this slide, symptoms will be blue and labs or imaging will be green. For Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, you'll see encephalopathy, ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, amnesia, which can be either enterograde or retrograde, and confabulation. If they're going to give you anything lab-related, you might see thymine levels or some imaging related to the mammillary bodies. For pancreatitis, remember that you'll have a patient with epigastric abdominal pain, which will radiate to the back. You might see nausea, vomiting, chills flank ecchymoses or periumbilical ecchymoses. If they give you labs, obviously they'll give you amylase and lipase, but actually what they could give you just by itself, if they really want to be tricky, is just to give you a calcium level. And recall that hypocalcemia is what you want to look for. For beriberi, you have either the dry beriberi or the wet beriberi. And all this means is that dry is symmetrical peripheral neuropathy and wet is high output heart failure. They give you labs for beriberi. They'll probably give you a thymine level or they'll describe somebody to you with other labs that will either paint the picture of somebody who's volume overloaded. So that would be the high output heart failure or they'll give you somebody with non-inflammatory demyelination if they're going for the dry beriberi. A um, couple more dilated cardiomyopathy. So you're going to see somebody who has symptoms of systolic heart failure. They'll have potentially a systolic murmur and the S3 heart sound. And then if they give you some type of imaging or echo, you could see dilated ventricles, ballooning of the heart, or a bundle branch block. For cerebellar degeneration, you'll have cerebellar symptoms, as the name implies. So you could see vertigo, you could see ataxia, you could see either dysarthria, which is a speech abnormality, or dysmetria, which is uncoordinated movement. And then if they give you some exam findings or labs, you want to look for things like dysdiaticokinesia, the finger to nose testing, Stuart Holm sign, which you Google this, but it's basically known as rebound elbows or cerebellar drift. So you're going to be looking mostly clinically in cerebellar degeneration for different exam findings, but long-term alcohol use definitely results in cerebellar degeneration. For gastritis, you, you will see hematemesis, upper GI pain, indigestion and early satiety. If they're gonna go in the direction of imaging or labs, they'll probably give you images from an endoscopy or they'll give you the results of some type of H. pylori related testing. Usually that's either the stool antigen or the urease breath tests. And then lastly, for the disease whose name I really don't know how to pronounce, Marchia Fava Bignami disease, you're gonna see a whole host of neuropsychiatric symptoms. Could be personality change, could be dementia, could be uh, subthreshold psychotic symptoms, but really what's going to seal the diagnosis here is going to be the imaging. So you see corpus callosum degeneration plus or minus B vitamin levels and probably not B vitamin levels, but the, the prevailing theory is that this disease where you see corpus callosum degeneration is related to decreased vitamin B levels. So again, I just wanted to run through all of these and kind of create the network in your brain so you're looking for these associations. So if you get a test question and they tell you that the person drinks 10, you know, whatever ounce beers a day, this is what you want to start to think about so that when you then see the lab print out, your brain is thinking, all right, they gave me a question about alcohol. Now they're showing me something with stool. Maybe it's gastritis. Or they gave me a patient who clearly has evidence of long-term alcohol use. They gave me the presence of an S3 heart sound dilated cardiomyopathy. So the sooner that you can make these associations, the more free points that you're going to pick up on USMLE and Comlex.
So that wraps up alcohol. And as you will see moving forward in this video, alcohol is the one drug with the most associations and the most nitty gritty information that you need to know. Really honestly, everything from here on forward is gonna be extremely straightforward with classic signs of intoxication, classic signs of withdrawal, and very few, relatively speaking, fewer associations. So let's talk about opioids. So opioids, when in the intoxicated state, the person will feel euphoric. They're going to feel really good. They'll also have central nervous system and respiratory depression. So this is really the cause of death when it comes to overdosing on opioids. Classically, you'll see pinpoint pupils, so pupillary constriction, and a decreased gag reflex. Now, Remember back from the alcohol part of this video, I told you that whatever the drug does in, an, in its intoxication state, it does the opposite in its withdrawal state. So you can see here that the withdrawal state has dilated pupils because the intoxicated state has pinpoint pupils. And the withdrawal state is like fluid and liquid coming out of everywhere. So lacrimation, sweating, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And if you think about somebody classically who gets opioids for pain or related to surgery, you might remember that it causes pretty serious constipation. So if when you take the opioid, it causes constipation, then when you withdraw from it and have the opposite effect, you have liquid and fluid coming out of everywhere. So sweating, lacrimation, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Should make sense. The one particularly unique symptom in opioid withdrawal is yawning. And because it's unique, it shows up on USMLE and Comlex a lot. And the way that I encourage you to remember this is the opioid ooze. The opioid ooze. Reminds me that opioids in withdrawal cause yawning. The opioid ooze. How do you like that big berry on? Now, as far as associations go, like I said, opioids are much more straightforward than alcohol. The big ones you want to think about are right-sided endocarditis and abscesses, but you also want to link this in your brain to hepatitis, HIV, AIDS, and of course, overdose. Now, when it comes to USMLE and Comlex, the associations, like I said, you really want to remember right-sided endocarditis and abscesses. So getting back to this idea of creating associations and concept maps to help you anticipate and dominate third order questions, if the test writer wants you to pick endocarditis or wants to make that a connection when they start the question with opioids but end it with something cardiovascular, they'll give you symptoms like Roth spots, Janeway lesions, splinter hemorrhages, Osler nodes, fever, shortness of breath. And as far as imaging or labs, you want to be on the lookout for valve vegetations, anemia, positive blood cultures, etc. Recall that the reason that right-sided endocarditis is associated with opioids, but even broadly, intravenous drug abuse, is because the blood will flow through the right side of the heart first, and therefore a lot of these symptoms will cause right-sided endocarditis when the infectious agents or pathogens flow through the right side of the heart. And similarly, opioids are related to abscesses for you know, this, the same reasoning. You got a lot of pathogen exposure when it comes to intravenous drug abuse. So if they want you to think about abscesses, they'll go after painful, warm, purulent, or fluctuant masses. And as far as labs go, they could give you a leukocytosis, CRP, procalcitonin, and maybe even advanced imaging if they want you to suspect risk for osteomyelitis. So when it comes to opioids, just remember the things that are related to intravenous drug abuse, right-sided endocarditis, and abscesses. So with that, that wraps up high-yield opioids. Now let's talk about benzodiazepines. So benzodiazepines are very similar in terms of intoxication and withdrawal to alcohol because alcohol is a sedative. It acts on GABA. Benzos, and also we'll talk briefly, barbiturates, are also sedatives, and they also work on GABA. So unsurprisingly, you're going to see similar intoxicated states and similar withdrawal states. So for intoxication, we are talking about things like ataxia, mild respiratory depression, 
and somnolence. And if in the intoxication state you see all these inhibitory actions, then the opposite of that is true in the withdrawal state. So you see excitatory actions. So if benzos make you sleep, when you withdraw from them, you get insomnia. If benzos treat anxiety, then when you withdraw from them, you get anxiety. And just like other sedatives, you can get withdrawal seizures for the same reasons we talked about back in the alcohol section. Now of note, it is important for me to point out, withdrawal seizures from benzos can occur on a much more drawn out or delayed timeline. So you can have somebody that's withdrawing from benzos and then up to like one to three weeks later, they can still have a withdrawal seizure. So just being outside of that usual timeline that you think of when you think of alcohol withdrawal seizures does not necessarily mean that the withdrawal seizure can't be due to withdrawing from benzodiazepines. Now, as far as associations, it's actually not the related diseases or complications that you need to know when it comes to benzos. For whatever reason, test writers for USMLE and Comlex love, 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 love to ask you the very subtle difference in the mechanism between benzodiazepines and barbiturates. And the reason that they do this is because the mechanisms, as you can see by looking on this slide, are so similar. So both benzos and barbs both affect chloride channel opening, working through and modulating GABA. The difference is that benzos increase the frequency of the chloride channel opening, whereas barbs increase the duration of chloride channel opening. And the way to remember this is that Ben wants it to happen more often, but barb wants it to last longer. Ah, thank you. All right, so that wraps up benzodiazepines. Next, we are going to talk about cocaine. Cocaine is a major stimulant. So when it comes to being intoxicated with cocaine, you see evidence of stimulation. So you'll see pupil dilation, agitation, euphoria, hallucinations, which can be different types of hallucinations, but for the purposes of USMLE or Comlex, you want to think about tactile hallucinations. So if the question gives you somebody who feels like bugs crawling on them, think cocaine, alertness, and arousal. So if all of that stuff, if being like supercharged and stimulated is what it feels like to be intoxicated with cocaine, then the opposite will be true in withdrawal. So if cocaine wakes you up and arouses you, then when you withdraw from it, people will feel sleepy. And when you withdraw from it, people will feel hungry because stimulants reduce appetite. And if it makes you feel euphoric, then when you withdraw from it, people will experience depression. Now worth mentioning is that the mechanism by which cocaine acts in the brain is that it's basically acting, acting as an antidepressant. It's increasing dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin in the brain. And that leads to these euphoric symptoms. Consequently, this is why when you then have withdrawal from cocaine and have the opposite effect, you experience depression. So it shouldn't surprise you to hear that cocaine is highly associated with drug-induced depression and drug-induced suicidal ideation when people are coming down off of their cocaine trips. The other associations that you want to keep in mind are what you see on this slide. Nasal septum perforation is a big one, and this is due to the vasoconstrictive properties of the stimulant cocaine. You can also get cocaine-induced cardiomyopathy. So when that person gets really supercharged on the stimulant, all of that supercharging puts them into sympathetic overdrive, which does have effects on the heart. People can also feel paranoid. They get hallucinations and tactile hallucinations and a little bit of impaired judgment and impaired reality testing leading to paranoia. We already talked about drug-induced depression. And then two related topics, which are extremely high yield for USMLE and Comlex, are to remember that cocaine can lead to renal tubular necrosis and rhabdomyolysis. So keep all these associations in mind because when you get that initial question on cocaine, chances are they're not going after just what's it like to be drugged up on cocaine. They're probably going after some complication or some association. So that wraps up everything that we need to talk about with regards to cocaine. Next, we're gonna focus on a very similar stimulant illicit drug, and that's methamphetamine. Now, because methamphetamine is also a stimulant and works very similarly to how cocaine works, it shouldn't surprise you that the intoxication and withdrawal states are pretty similar. For intoxication, you get sympathomimetic effects. So we're seeing things like pupil dilation, agitation, euphoria, hallucinations, 
arousal, alertness, and wakefulness. And consistent with the theme that we've talked about throughout this video thus far, if you have one syndrome in the intoxication state, then you have the opposite in the withdrawal state. So if intoxication is sympathomimetic effects, feeling supercharged, etc., then the withdrawal symptom should be the opposite. So you see that the opposite of agitation, euphoria, arousal, alertness is sleepiness, hunger, and depression. So the intoxication and withdrawal states of a lot of different stimulant drugs are very similar. Now, as far as the clinical associations that you want to be on the lookout for on your examination, USMLE or COMLEX, for methamphetamine, that's referred to as meth mouth. So meth mouth is the characteristic dental caries and just general poor dentition of people who suffer from stimulant use disorder, particularly methamphetamine use disorder. There are a couple different theories about why meth mouth is an entity. It seems to be a combination of a few things. One, when people are using methamphetamine, they're using a substance that has vasoconstrictive properties, and therefore it's possible that that vasoconstriction can lead to less blood flow or less salivary flow into the mouth, which generally predicts poor dental outcomes. The second thing is that people who use methamphetamine in general are already more likely, or less likely, I should say, to care about or pay attention to their dental hygiene. Lastly, there's an association between methamphetamine use and bruxism, so the constant clenching or grinding of the teeth is obviously not good for dental hygiene, but nonetheless, you have all of these things working in combination with one another, giving you this characteristic meth mouth. So if you're taking USMLE or Comlex and you have a patient in your clinical vignette using an unidentified stimulant and they describe meth mouth to you or they even show you a picture that looks like this, the test writer is telling you, hey, they're using methamphetamine. And lastly, before I go any further, I do want to just point out the mechanism or the pathophysiology of how methamphetamine works in the brain. So it causes a very strong burst of release of monoamine neurotransmitters. And when I use the terminology monoamine neurotransmitters, I'm referring to things like dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. So not only are methamphetamines sympathomimetic because it's causing the release of norepinephrine and dopamine, but it also has profound mood changes because it releases the same monoamines that are affected by things like antidepressants and antipsychotic medications. And when you have those monoamines being released in the brain in an uncontrolled, abusive fashion, you get things like alertness, arousal, euphoria, psychosis, etc. So that's methamphetamine. Again, bottom line here is be on the lookout for meth mouth, be on the lookout for clinical descriptions of meth mouth if the test writer doesn't give you a picture. That's methamphetamine. Now we're going to talk about PCP, phencyclidine. PCP intoxication is pretty characteristic. On exams, it's going to be someone who's violent. So the classic test description of somebody who's abusing or intoxicated with PCP is somebody that initially experiences a little bit of euphoria, right? They're feeling good. And then all of a sudden, they become violent and aggressive. And in the clinical vignette, it's going to say that like four to six people attempt to restrain the patient and it doesn't work. So the classic description is this like Herculean strength where you've got all these hospital security guards trying to hold the person down, get them under control so that they don't hurt themselves or don't hurt somebody else. But despite the fact that there's, you know, four to six security guards on the scene, the person is just thrashing about and kind of like breaking free and causing all of this mayhem. So if you get a test question on USMLE or Comlex and it's one person with seemingly superhuman strength, the test writer is telling you, hey, it's PCP. Now, as far as the pathophysiology of how PCP is working in the brain, it's actually a pretty complex drug. But on USMLE or Comlex, what I believe the test writer will go after is its action at the NMDA receptor. Specifically, PCP is an NMDA receptor antagonist. And that action, generally speaking, causes psychosis and to lesser extents when combined with its sympathomimetic effects, 
it causes analgesia. So when you put together somebody who's a little psychotic, a little euphoric, and can't really feel pain and might have these like superhuman feelings, that leads to this superhuman aggression, violence, and strength. So bottom line here is that on a test, somebody who's intoxicated with PCP is going to be going crazy and really hard to restrain and have this kind of like superhuman strength. Now, when it comes to withdrawal, withdrawal from PCP, honestly, on USMLE and Comlex is just not high yield at all. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but just for completeness sake, typically you'll see some mood disturbances, some insomnia, but coming down off PCP really isn't as high yield as what it looks like to be intoxicated on it. The clinical association that you want to look for for PCP, really the only thing is a unique type of nystagmus. And specifically, we're talking about rotatory, also known as torsional nystagmus. And I'm going to give you a mnemonic here to remember this, but I also want to just show you an image of what this looks like because a lot of people are used to either vertical or horizontal nystagmus. And if you look on the right part of this slide, rotatory nystagmus has, as the name implies, this sort of rotatory or torsional movement where it moves about the axis in a in a somewhat diagonal direction. And as far as my mnemonic is concerned, I think that pairing up rotatory or torsional nystagmus with PCP is easy to do if you can remember the full name of PCP being phencyclidine. So you see that I put the image of these rings or these cycles on the slide and that ring or that phencyclidine reminds me that the rotatory nystagmus kind of moves in a ring like uh, pattern about an axis. So w the way that the eyes move in my head looks like the way that the rings are organized and I remember the rings because it's phencyclidine and cycla or cycle should make you think of a ring chemically speaking and I'm very sorry if I'm triggering anybody's post-traumatic stress disorder from your organic chemistry class back in the day. But it, nonetheless, that's my mnemonic. I think it's easy to remember. Bottom line, when it comes to tests for PCP, you want to know about that superhuman strength, its mechanism being an NMDA receptor antagonist, and that the clinical finding or symptom that you'll see on exam if you look at somebody who's high on PCP is going to be that rotatory slash torsional nystagmus. So that's PCP. The next illicit drug that we're going to talk about is MDMA, also known as ecstasy. And as the name implies, ecstasy makes people feel like they are in ecstasy. So the symptoms of intoxication include hallucinations, euphoria, disinhibition, bruxism, and an altered sense of time and sensation. Now, MDMA works as basically like a supercharged antidepressant. It works on serotonin receptors and dopamine receptors to block the reuptake of those neurotransmitters, thereby increasing the amount of serotonin and dopamine in the synaptic cleft. Withdrawal symptoms of ecstasy, just like the withdrawal symptoms of PCP, are absolutely not high yield, so tune me out for the next 10 seconds if you don't care. But just for completeness sake, the symptoms of withdrawal from ecstasy are anxiety, concentration difficulties, and depression. Since MDMA kind of works like a supercharged SSRI, the clinical associations make sense if you think about what you might see in an SSRI. So serotonin syndrome, hyponatremia slash thirst slash seizures should both make sense. Serotonin syndrome because this works on serotonin, and you should know that your SSRIs can cause SIADH. Likewise, MDMA can cause the person to feel excessive thirst, and when people are drinking water over and over and over again while intoxicated on MDMA, they can become hyponatremic, and if their sodium level drops to a certain threshold, they can experience seizures. Now, bruxism is also a classic association. So when you see bruxism, you want to be thinking immediately about either MDMA or methamphetamine, and then kind of narrow it down further based on what else the question or clinical vignette gives you. The unique clinical association to MDMA is this thing called hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, which is a fancy way of saying that when somebody does ecstasy, some of that ecstasy can actually be stored in the body, stored in some of the tissues in the body. And then later on, when the person is not actively choosing to get high on MDMA, those stores can actually slowly release and the person can re-experience the intoxicating effects of MDMA. 
So bottom line here, as far as what you should take out of this slide, for examination purposes, know that MDMA kind of works like a supercharged antidepressant. And therefore, when people are intoxicated on MDMA, they're going to feel really good. And when they're coming off of it, they're going to feel really depressed. But as well, the associations are going to be things like serotonin syndrome, hyponatremia, thirst, slash seizures. And MDMA, generally speaking, is going to be described to you on an exam like the classic picture of what you think about when you think about your you know 70s era hippie getting high on some drug they're gonna feel good they're gonna have an altered sense of time and sensation what's up man you want some that's what mdma is gonna look like on a test so pretty straightforward but that is mdma the last category that we need to talk about is marijuana so marijuana what uh, basically works by interacting with the CB1 and CB2 receptors. So we're talking about cannabinoid receptors now. I think that most people are probably comfortable with the clinical picture of what it looks like to be intoxicated with marijuana. It looks like somebody who is calm, whose anxieties generally go away, who may have altered judgment or slowed reaction time. The munchies are characteristic, so you're going to see increased appetite and conjunctival injection, so redness in the eye. Pretty straightforward. Now, we've talked about this ad nauseum today, but if that's what intoxication looks like, then withdrawal is the opposite. So if when you smoke weed, you are hungry, calm, and can sleep well, then when you're coming off of marijuana, you have a decreased appetite, you can't sleep, and you're irritable. So it should make a lot of sense that intoxication and withdrawal are opposites. Now, there are two very characteristic associations with marijuana that you want to be on the lookout for on USMLE and Comlex. One is that in a certain percentage of people that use marijuana, they actually don't experience the calmness and the classic picture that you might have in your brain when you think about somebody smoking weed. Instead, they have psychosis, paranoia, and it's really what's called, quote, a bad trip. So for those people in particular, marijuana can be quite psychotomimetic, meaning it makes you psychotic and paranoid. The other high-yield clinical association to be on the lookout for is cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And the pathophysiology here is still somewhat poorly understood as more research is coming out. But what, what this kind of looks like here is somebody uses marijuana consistently for a long time. And then at some point, they either change the amount of marijuana that they're using drastically. So maybe they go from smoking four times a day to not at all. Or they have some type of paradoxical reaction where all of a sudden they just have this profuse vomiting. So they're very nauseous. They're vomiting nonstop. And interestingly, you want to look for this buzzword on USMLE or Comlex. In, in, in response to heat, the symptoms get better. So the classic patient with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome will have profuse vomiting and they'll learn that the only way to make that better or to make that stop is to take a hot shower. I know this sounds ridiculous, but this is a very uh, poorly understood but increasingly common clinic clinical entity. And for that reason, you want to know this because it's my guess that within the next couple of years maybe, the pathophysiology will be very well understood and this will be a new high-yield buzzword thing that's going to show up on exams all the time. And I would also couple that with the fact that if you look in the U.S. what's happening with marijuana, with all of these states legalizing it, it's very important that you understand what the clinical sequelae might look like. So be on the lookout for cannabinoid hyperemesis. Again, somebody that's using marijuana that has profuse vomiting that gets better in response to heat. That's marijuana. All right, so with that, we've now gone through all of the high-yield drugs of abuse. Again, just to summarize, we talked about what it looks like to be intoxicated, what it looks like when the person's going through withdrawal, and I tried to touch on all of the high-yield clinical associations that are either associations with complications or associations with other medical conditions so that you can train your brain to make those high-yield neural networks and dominate those third-order questions. Now what I want to do for the next like 20 seconds is just run through 
rapid review style, some high yield symptoms to test you to see if you can pull out what you need to know when you're given certain buzzwords. So let's just do this real quick. I think this will be useful to you. I'm going to show you a picture and that picture will either be a drug, a certain type of drug intoxication or a certain type of drug withdrawal. And based on that picture or that buzzword, you have to tell me what drug intoxication or what drug withdrawal we're talking about. So let's get started. All right, so you see pupillary constriction here, and it's important to remember that this could actually be two things. This is either opioid intoxication, so that's pupil constriction, or it's stimulant withdrawal. And remember that this could be either the intoxication or the opposite of a different type of intoxication. So opioid intoxication causes pupillary constriction, stimulant intoxication causes pupillary dilation, and therefore the opposite of stimulant intoxication, stimulant withdrawal, would be pupillary constriction as well. So this is an either or, and it would depend on other things in the question. All right, what do you see here? You see a lot of redness of the eye. This is conjunctival injection. This is marijuana intoxication. Next, what do you see here? You see really poor dentition, which should immediately make you think meth mouth, methamphetamine abuse. Remember, vasoconstriction of blood supply and saliva to the mouth, bruxism, patients that are constantly abusing this substance and probably don't pay a lot of attention to their dental hygiene. This is meth mouth. What if you have somebody who's excessively thirsty? What drug are we talking about? We're talking about MDMA ecstasy intoxication. Remember, this can lead to hyponatremia and seizures, and you want to pair all that up with MDMA because it's very serotonergic. All right, what if you see somebody who's, have, who's just yawning a lot? What should that make you think in terms of drugs of abuse? That should make you think of the opioid O's. Remember, the opioid O's. Opioid withdrawal causes yawning. And then lastly... Somebody feeling like they have bugs crawling on their skin. What should that make you think when it comes to drugs of abuse? When it comes to those tactile hallucinations, feeling like bugs are crawling on your skin, you want to think cocaine intoxication. All right, so that wraps up everything in this video. The last slide I want to give you is just for completeness sake and for your studying pleasure. This is all of the substances that we talked about with their formal mechanism or formal pathophysiology written out. So if you want this, come to this slide at the end of the video. This again is just for your studying pleasure. I went through this video, this was a long one. I went through it relatively quickly, although I tried to spend a lot of time on the individual areas that I really want you to focus on. Because again, I think the most important thing is making those high yield associations. A lot of questions on USMLE and Comlex start as if they're gonna ask you about substance abuse and then it pivots into something else. And they're either relying on a buzzword, a clinical finding or an association or a complication. And this is a great way for test writers to challenge your brain to think clinically, to think logically, and to make high yield connections. So I hope this video was useful to you. If it was, please consider clicking the join button and contributing to my, my channel financially. Wish you guys the best of luck. Keep killing it. Love you.